Jeff, it's um, great to see you. And um, as we were saying, it's about 40 plus years since we last so, saw you. But actually, I want to start by offering you an apology. Because I think the last time we were due to see you was at the Sidmouth Folk Festival. And we broke up about two weeks before it. And only Louis came down to, to Sidmouth. So uh, apologies from the rest of us for that but it's nice to get back together again well i think that was a time i did it as a duo with joy who hasn't, who hasn't played for quite a few years but i'm pleased to say about a couple of years ago i was doing a, a national tour with show of hands steve knightley and phil beer and i did the main stage there in, in the big ham uh, marquee and um to about uh, 1500 people so uh, that was a that was a lovely thing to do and, uh, and i haven't been back to sidmouth since but you remember, Jeff, I showed up and you said, where are the others? And I said, we broke up. And you said, oh, do you want to join a band? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yes. And that, that was the sort of Cayley band, really, wasn't it? A40 Improvement Scheme. Uh, how much have you been playing? Well, here's the thing. You know, I was the journalist for 50 years. It was a very busy job. When I moved down to the West Country for the Daily Mirror to cover the West Country, I went all over the world as well, but I was based down here. And I would go to folk clubs and would do the odd gig. But when I uh, sort of retired properly, uh, my boys, you know, who, who you all know and all heard of, uh, said, you want to play some more music? So um, Sean, whose uh, studio I'm in now, uh, he's a great producer. He's, in fact, he just produced the Levelers' uh, latest uh, album, which comes out next month. He's done several of theirs. He said, I'll produce an album for you. So I had to go away and practice a bit and get up to speed. And um, I produced this album. Uh, and I was just amazed because it had extraordinary reviews, four or five star reviews and lots and lots of radio plays. And then the festivals and gigs started coming in. So I started playing at a, you know, what I call a professional level. I like to think I was a professional level, but I started going out and, and gigging and, and going to like Orkney Folk Festival and Sark and Cambridge and Shrewsbury, all the, all the big uh, festivals. The Cornwall Folk Festival asked me to be their um, uh, co-patron. Um, I'm a co-patron of Cornwall with uh, Wiz Jones, the great guitarist. And... Um, uh, I was due to do about eight festivals this summer. Uh, should have been last month in Ibiza, Costa del Folk. And um, uh, there were about seven other festivals. Of course, none of us are out there playing. I haven't really played and performed since March the 15th. That was one of the things talking about your, your solo LP, Jeff, is that it seemed that it slowly acquired a cast of thousands through various neighbours and you know when you've got neighbours like Nick Jones and I suppose you could call Jim Corsier a neighbour because he's not that far away from you is he it kind of grew didn't it well you see I am um, useless with technology so I recorded most of uh, the vocals and the concertina in my cottage in the next village and Sean would come over and tell me off and say it was it, that shit do it again <laughs> yeah that's rubbish <laughs> do it again and then I finally got some takes and when he brought them back to me, he'd added a bit of sensational guitar because he is a fantastic uh, flat pick, six string guitarist. And um, uh, then the next time he brought a track back, Catherine, you know, Catherine Roberts, he's married to, uh, had put some harmonies on. And then it grew because Sam, middle son's married to Cara Dillon, the Irish singer, heard about this and said, oh, Cara's a bit miffed. She, she wants to sing on it. And if she's going to sing on it, I want to play the piano. <laughs> and his chest was in the middle of a two-year world tour with Robert Plant, um, but he was around, and uh, or he's just starting it. Sorry, he hadn't gone off yet. And I said, "Do you mind doing a bit of fiddle and viola?" And he was the most annoying of all because it took me two or three months to get my bits right. And he came Seth into the studio with Sean, and he did seven tracks either on fiddle or viola in about uh, one hour thirty minutes. <laughs> And then went shopping or to collect the kids for play school. Cheeky bugger. Well, then, as you say, there was um, Jim Causley, Sam Kelly. Um, oh, Ben Nichols, the great bass player in Seth's band. And then Nick Jones, who lives in my village. He was literally passing my door. And I, I thought, uh, Nick, do you want to sing on my album? And I dragged him upstairs. 
and played in this uh, uh, um, lovely song by uh, Reg Miros, a contemporary song. And he heard it once and immediately sang this haunting sort of harmony. And he said, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. A song called England Green, England Grey. Quite a political song, actually. And Reg Miros has been ever so grateful because I got so many radio, more, more radio plays to start with than Reg had got for that. And the BBC thought it was a bit political. But isn't it interesting that, that your kids didn't break away from the tradition, quotes unquote, they kept within a, a, a tradition that they could join in with what you were playing rather than just going off and doing something completely different? Yeah, well, uh, Seth is a folk musician, full stop, but, you know, but he's had top ten, oh, four or five top ten albums and, and, and other singles. Um, but 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 he is he writes folk songs and, and 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 he loves going to folk sessions and he you know he headlines big folk festivals. Sean and Catherine have just won their fourth best folk duo in the UK award, so they're definitely folk. And Sam and Carr, of course, because of her of her Irish dimension, um, that, that's out and out folk. Although she's done stuff for Disney and all sorts of people, um, so they're rooted in uh, in folk and roots music. But but they've gone off and plowed their own furrows, which I'm very pleased about. Music then, they all started when they were about five. Uh, but um, yeah, but we were always playing, funny enough, Led Zeppelin, um, all those years ago, and uh, Pink Floyd, and James Taylor, and, and Dylan, and uh, yeah, big band music. My kids were always exposed to a, a very, very eclectic taste in music. And I think that's why they've always had a very wide taste um, and uh, went off and did, did their own thing. And uh, you know, they like sort of country Americana. Seth, in particular, uh, loves uh, sort of Americana stuff. And when he was going around the States several times with Robert, he got to meet some of his big heroes, so like, you know, Billy Miller and uh, uh, Emilio Harris and uh, all these people, you know. Um, uh, I do a lot of that Americana stuff, which I'm sort of known for now because the concertina isn't really known for that, that sort of music, you know. <laughs> It's got a chorus. <laughs> dig a little deeper in the wild, boys. You gotta dig a little deeper in the wild. If you want a good, if you want a good cool drink of water, you gotta dig a little deeper in the wild. Dig a little deeper in the wild, boys. You gotta dig a little deeper in the wild. If you want a good cool drink of water, you gotta dig a little deeper in the wild. <laughs> Daddy used to tell me, don't be fooled by all you see. If you want to get to the heart of things, you gotta get way down deep. Second place, don't get it, son. We're gonna come in first. Ain't nothing worse than taking a drink that leaves you with the thirst. Come on, boys, sing. Dig a little deeper in the wild, boys. You gotta dig a little deeper in the wild. If you wanna be the border, you gotta dig a little deeper in the wild. Dig a little deeper in the wild, boys. You gotta dig a little deeper in the wild. If you wanna go through the border, you gotta dig a little deeper in the wild. I'll cut out a verse. There's a mighty river flowing where the water's cool and sweet. Now don't be fooled by the muddy stream. Be careful when you drink. Life is what you make it. Sometimes it's a the bin hell. If you want to make it to the promised land, you gotta dig a little deeper in the well. Dig a little deeper in the well, boys. You gotta dig a little deeper in the well. If you want a good cool drink of water, you gotta dig a little deeper in the well. Dig a little deeper in the well, boys. You gotta dig a little deeper in the well. If you want a good cool drink of water, you gotta dig a little deeper in the well. Uh, 
Jeff, you, you've obviously passed on a great tradition to to um, to your sons. Did you get anything from your parents, or, or, or did you just kind of pick it up from going to the local pubs and clubs? No, my dad uh, was a trumpeter, although he he, he never ha helped teach me. Uh, and one grandfather played the fiddle, and the other played the banjo. Uh, so there's music in the family. And uh, Joy's uh, granddad <laughs> was. Uh, Cornet player in the Black Dyke uh, band, Black Dyke. Oh, yeah, yeah, band yeah. York, yeah. Really? yeah. And uh, so there's this sort of music uh, is a thread on both sides of the family. And Joy, when she was at school, learned the violin, and she was in the uh, in the Bach choir, you know, and sang at the Albert Hall. The whole family is, apart from me, is performed at the Albert Hall. Regions, <laughs> but Sean and Catherine. Uh, when Sean and Catherine won one of their uh, BBC uh, Radio Two awards, that was actually at, at the the Albert Hall. But I'm the only one not to do the Albert Hall. Before we leave the subject of, of the the family, can you tell me what they think of you? And I mean, don't don't, don't be don't be modest, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Because you and Joy played together for such a long time and you were really good. How do they, how do they relate to you? Do they treat you as a resource? Uh, yeah, in the early days, but see, we had a family band. So when they were all about, uh, Seth was about uh, 10, uh, uh, Sam 11, 12, uh, Sean 13, 14, we were doing big professional gigs as a family band. And then Joy was very ill and gave up. But she then became their manager, and she's the one who got them all the big record deals with Warner and Polygram and all these people. But um, the kids in turn were always very encouraging for me, because after the Lakeman brothers took off, and then they um, teamed up with uh, Kate Rusby and Catherine Roberts and became Equation. We stepped right back because they were in a different league to us. But I still ended up playing with, with, with them. I remember doing a Strawberry Festival uh, in Yosemite in California in front of about 5,000 people uh, with Equation. And I've done Cambridge and with them. And uh, I get up with Seth at uh, Beautiful Days, which is the Levelers Festival. And then you get quite a few thousand people there. So they don't mind me getting up on a stage with them. But they just think it's hilarious that, that you know, sometimes I've, I've got more gigs than they have. <laughs> <laughs> Not as big a gigs. When do you suddenly think, all right, the concertina, that's for me, because we're talking standard instruments, aren't we? Guitar, banjo, and the rest of the stuff. And then suddenly you pick up a concertina. I can't read music and I've never had a music lesson. And I went into a folk club in Boston in Lincolnshire and I saw Dave and Tony Arthur. Tony Arthur okay. was killing away on a little English concertina, you know, the one with the thumb grips. And I thought, well, I might be able to do that because it didn't involve holding any strings down and knowing anything about it. <laughs> so I, I went, this is about 1971, I went to the Salvation Army headquarters in Judd Street, which was near King's Cross. And they had a big glass case, the size of this wall here, um, full of concertinas, which weren't so popular those days, but the Salvation Army were, were selling them off. And I bought this one. The man kept saying, you want that one? You want that one in the corner? And it was because he was an old uh, uh, Salvation Army cap captain, and he had old gnarled fingers. He couldn't play anymore because of his rheumatism. And this one is in the case. He said, you want that one? Now, I didn't know it's a duet, which is the most complicated, fiendish device. <laughs> anybody. And it was 35 quid, which was, you know, like two, two, two weeks groceries or more in those days, and I bought it. I took it out and Joy went mad. He's, have we got 35 quid? And it's insured for about 8,000 pounds now. Look at that, 1926. Isn't that beautiful? I saw them in the spring In April, May, and likewise June When small birds they do sing when small birds they do sing. My garden was well provided with flowers everywhere. I had not the liberty to choose for myself the flowers that I should wear. Oh, the flowers I should wear. The gardener was standing by when I asked him to choose for me. He 
shows me the lily and the violet and the pink. And I refuse all three. Oh, I refuse all three. All the lily I first forsook, because it fades so soon. Violet and pink, well, I both overlooked. And I vowed I'd wait till June, and I vowed I'd wait till June. For in June there's a red rose bud, and that's the flower for me. Of times I have snatched at the red rose bud, and gained but the willow tree, and gained but the willow tree. Now the willow tree will twist, and the willow tree will twine. And I wish I was in that young girl's arms, that once had this love all mine. Oh, once had this love all mine. The Siege of Love. You were pulling the instrument out and pushing it back in again, not doing what the concertina I always thought of, which is this sort of suck, blow, suck, blow, yeah. right? So why do, you, why do you call that the most difficult of the concertinas? Because the three main uh, types of the English, the ones where you get little thumb grits, and in, 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 in the tonic so far, you do a do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. On the Anglo, which is the one most people are familiar with for Irish music and everything else, it's like a harmonica, it's push-pull. So you get one note in and a different note out. This is fully chromatic on both sides. So it's a 58 button machine, right? But there's two reeds for every button, uh, but because it's unisonic. So it's the same in or out. So it... yeah. What it gives you is it's not much, much more a bellows control. You know, especially on harmonic things, you know. <laughs> you, there's none of that frantic Popeye stuff going on. I've always thought of the Constantino with sea shanties and things like that. But one of the things I've also read is that actually Constantinas aren't very good when they get wet. <laughs> No, uh, I have had mine at sea, but no, they didn't last long. And, and they literally sort of buy them, play them for a short time, throw them away. They had cardboard bellows and, you know, they're pretty manky instruments. But they were very cheap when they were very popular in the 19th century. But they weren't, in truth, the, mo the, most, uh, uh, the best instrument to have on, on a sh ship in salty uh, and damp, damp air or waves breaking over you. It's a bit of a fallacy. Same with melodians, any, any other sort of instrument like that, any reed instrument. Um, uh, I mean... You know, no, no more so than a fiddle. You just don't want to expose some, an instrument like this to, to the elements, do you? Do you have to tune it? Yeah, I, I don't go near it. There's, I use a specialist. To, there's a guy called Nigel Stura down here in Devon. He's one of about five craftsmen. There's about five others in America who can do it. Um, and you leave the tuning of them uh, to, to, to the people who know what they're doing. And uh, uh, I wouldn't say it's perfect, but this is in, is in standard sort of concert pitch. Um, but you start messing around, adding metal to each little reed or scraping. I mean, scraping metal off is the worst thing, because if you take more than you need, you're, you're jiggered then, because, um, you know, you, you can't really put it back. You have to start with another reed. If, if a spring breaks or a pad falls off, I'll go inside. There's a couple of thousand parts in here. Springs, screws, pads, bushings. It's ridiculous. I mean, it is like a jack-in-the-box. When you take it to bits, you really, you know... <laughs> You, you want to be in the bath, really, because everything goes ping. <laughs> Not bad value for 35 quid, then. 35, that's the best 35 quid I ever spent. <laughs> I've got one I bought, um, uh, not at Bonham, you know, Bonham's, uh, there was something, I bought one at Bonham's. I bought one at an auction about two months ago, um, and I paid about two and a half thousand pounds. It's another wheat stone, but they don't oh. come cheap. So, on the whole, when you look back at this whole thing, do you think to yourself, yeah, our stewardship of this kind of music 
was a good thing. We, we, we did the right thing. We, we had a good time. Uh, but you think about it, we were all in our 20s, early 20s. And I do folk clubs now. There's some really good ones going. But the people who run them are all 70 or 80 years old and they're dying off. And they COVID is not going to do us any favours because a lot of those folk clubs won't reopen. People are going to be too scared to go to them, at least until we've got a vaccine. And even beyond that, they'll have got out of the habit. But I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not uh, pessimistic about the music because there are more people, young people playing folk music than ever before. I don't know whether it's the right way forward, but you know, uh, for 10, 20 years now, 15 years, uh, Newcastle University, the SAGE has had this degree course, Leeds College of Music, which Sean went to, he did a, a jazz guitar and popular music course there, but they now have a folk music degree course there. I think there's one in Sussex and there's one, in, uh, so there's a lot of um, uh, very able young musicians. Some come from folky backgrounds, some don't, but they're being taught music from the perspective of, of folk uh, and, uh, and ethnic music. Um, and then the other thing is, although the folk clubs are diminishing uh, quite rapidly, sadly, um, there's, there's several hundred festivals in the UK alone. Um, so there are places, if you're good enough, for people uh, to perform at. But I, I accept what you say. It's not like it was when we were living in London and <clears throat> we were at the Herga and also at the Uxbridge with you. And you could go into London or anywhere around I mean, the M25 wasn't even built then, but anywhere within the M25 in those days, you could have gone to two or three different folk clubs on any night of the week, couldn't you? Yeah, I'm, I'm very optimistic about it. Um, uh, whether as many young people, and there's some very gifted young people, um, will make the sort of living that my kids have had, I know, but even though I say it myself, they are exceptional. Uh, and the cohort of young musicians who grew up with them, like Eliza Carthy and Benjamin Kirkpatrick and, and John Bowden and Spears and all those sort of people. Having said that, there's a lot of professional standard musicians now coming out uh, who want to play folk music. Whether they can actually get enough gigs to make a living out of it, I don't know. I think it's great that a lot of them might become teachers and, then, and, and they'll, they'll, they'll then be instilling folk music in, into young people. Um, so that may be one of the pluses. But I've got to say also, although it's not happening at the moment, one of the things that's burgeoned um, and might have actually in some way contributed to a lessening of folk clubs is the number of sessions, certainly down in the West Country, Cornwall, Devon, where I am. Um, you can go to sessions uh, most nights of the week. And so if you just enjoy playing for fun, there's plenty of music to be had. <laughs> The news is out all over town. Have you been seen running round and over the line? Should leave but then I just can't go. You win again. All this heart of mine. Never see what everybody knew but me. Just trusting you was my great sin. What can I do? You win again. Love it. Love it. I've got a very exciting project at the moment. I'm meeting my new, duo, my new duo partner, Rob Merch, tomorrow in a wood on Dartmoor. It sounds a bit dodgy, doesn't it? Um, but he is the most phenomenal five-string banjo player. He's very unique in his style, but he is a virtuoso. <laughs> I've been playing him a lot of my Tim Pan Alley stuff and, and he's been teaching me some of the old Joe Morley banjo type things and we both like sort of rag time and so on. So um, there's a great musical meeting of minds going on there. The style, I've never quite heard anything quite like it. It's amazing. It's yeah. Do you know what tuning he uses? Because Louis occasionally uses C, whereas bluegrass is a G. Yeah. But, uh, I, I wouldn't know. Uh, the distinctive sound he gets, and some of the purists in the classical banjo world uh, sneer at him, is that I think he still uses gut strings, but he uses metal picks. 
and he has a particularly percussive style. So, yeah. so he's loud and um, percussive and, and a sort of aggressive with it. And that, of course, suits the concertina. Those two instruments together, even acoustically, very dynamic. And he's a big jolly bloke. He would be <laughs> play like, like he does. He's got big fingers like sausages. And uh, <laughs> he's a sort of mechanic and woodsman and uh, general all round good guy doing all sorts of impossible things. Uh, and yet, when he picks up a banjo, it sings. <laughs> From the age of 10 to about 20, he had lessons with a guy called Tom Barrable, who was the last of one of the great uh, players on the halls. And he taught um, Rob properly and uh, would literally wrap his knuckles if he didn't do what he scaled. <laughs> I tell you, I tell you, what reminds me of, and, and they have met, um, uh, the way uh, Rob obviously learned the banjo was exactly the same. Chris Newman told me he learned the guitar. He would just do scales and scales and scales, different keys every day. For years that's the only way you get that good you know i mean louis yeah. you know that we're on are we we're literally right in the middle of dartmoor stick a pin in the middle so we don't know where we are really and uh, we've got an audience of cows behind there here's a bit of ragtime played during lockdown i think the last time we met up was about march the 15th and it's now july the 10th so uh, it was lovely 